Um, I think I should do a video to explain why I flashed Parliament, which I didn't even do, like it was a fake flash. Um, but there's been quite a lot of media coverage and um, a lot of opinion online. The vast majority of it I haven't seen because, you know, if you've spent hours and hours in Parliament this week, you're a wee bit behind with Christmas. And um, so I've been really busy trying to <laughs> sort everything out for that. But it seems that quite a lot of the reporting and opinion online is is maybe not got any relevance to what actually happened. So um, the government have put through legislation, which means that women in Scotland no longer have the right to single sex spaces, amongst some other stuff. And um, this is after six years of consultation to try and get this Gender Recognition Reform Act through. The the, the reason it's been raised is to, um, to benefit people that have got a gender difference who, you know, they want to have their paperwork align with their legal sex. Um, so they they want to have their their birth certificate and their, their passport and everything all, all matching, which, you know, I understand. I understand why that would be important to somebody. Um, but in six years, the government have not listened to women and about how if you allow in law somebody who's male, who has f in, on, in legal terms changed sex, which isn't a thing that a human being can do, then that person has access to all of women's single sex spaces and that has an impact on women who need single sex spaces like women of faith or um, women who have had trauma or women who would just like a bit of privacy, thanks very much, or women who are gay who want to meet and socialise with other women without anybody that is male there, regardless of how that male person perceives himself, because the reality is you can't, you can't change sex. Women see sex much more quickly than most, most women see sex in a way that's more, that's faster than most male people. So, given that in six years the government have refused to hear women's voices, they weren't going to start, were they? <laughs> so I knew that this um, this legislation was going to pass, everybody did. Um, I also knew that there would be a moment, once the vote went through, to steal attention. Because I wanted to, to grab it away from what trans people have gained, which I don't think is a transphobic act, but put the focus onto what women have lost, because that has been dismissed through the whole process. And I thought, if I can get the attention, then I can make change the narrative and focus on the stuff that has been consistently dismissed by the government, which would be quite handy. Um, because the world is watching what's going on in Scotland yesterday. Um, Spain passed similar legislation. Um, there's quite a lot going on in Australia and New Zealand. You know, women are losing rights to body autonomy all over the world. And, and you know, Afghanistan announced that they're not going to educate girls at all. Um, it's really, it, it, it's, it's getting a bit much, do you know? So I think that if women are losing their rights to privacy and safety and dignity and education and bodily autonomy, well, if, if negotiating within the system doesn't work, well, we'll just do something else then, wouldn't we? We're, women are resor resourceful. And because I live in Scotland, I have the right to protest. I have the right of freedom of speech. I am allowed to, to express myself in a way that might not be polite, but I don't feel like being polite when I'm watching government treat women with absolute contempt and the democratic process with contempt. This is not OK. And I want to complain about it. And they won't answer my emails. I mean, one of the MSPs <laughs> said that I had committed a crime by pointing out that the minister wasn't doing her job. And I did it in quite a direct way but I, I she thought that I was abusive towards this this woman I don't believe I was but she wouldn't give me right of reply she made this accusation on Twitter of all places and then blocked me I emailed into her office she wouldn't reply I emailed into her gender recognition unit who don't sign the civil servant that writes back to you doesn't sign the letter because of security because you know I'm a threat I mean maybe I am maybe I am a threat I made a joke a long time ago about a strident missile. That could well be me. Anyway, 
it's just it's just not okay i've said before that every single government inquiry into failures of health care for women or maternity services says at the end of it we should listen to women despite which these changes are never properly enacted on and that's because women's voices aren't heard um and this is like they just the changes aren't implemented um women are, are silenced and always have been in history and society and it doesn't really matter whether you're you know you're you're a, a woman now trying to engage in the gender recognition reform stuff or if you were at Green and Common or if you were just a silly suffragette and I was trying to think of who had commented on this and there's a, a book by Dale Spender who's you know like second wave feminist this is I think it must be from the 70s this book and she says in it I've written it down otherwise I'll get it wrong that a per Patriarchal society depends in large measure on the experience and values of males being perceived as the only frame of reference for society. And therefore it needs to be prevent women from sharing or establishing and asserting their equally real and valid but different frame of reference, which is the outcome of different experience. That's from Women of Ideas. And I think that's all that has been missing from this process. Women's perceptions of this need for people that are trans identified to have their their um, paperwork and, and self declare make the whole system much easier to get a certificate i understand that and i'm sympathetic towards it but the impact on women is dismissed and what's really frustrating to listen to in parliament is it was all about trans women trans men were if they were mentioned i missed it the whole focus was on male people which is just what Dale Spender says in her book, like, why are you not talking about the trans men and their needs? Because their needs are different from the needs of trans women and, and they are equal and they are equally as important. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because they're female. Who knows? So I shouldn't have been surprised by my government's complete refusal to meet with um, female survivors of sexual violence or parents of children that they, they've got concerns about because their children are autistic and, and there's this phenomenon that we don't understand where I think it's 40% of children who are in waiting lists for gender clinics are neurodiverse. And if the pathway is to give those, which is what WPATH says, is to give those children puberty blockers, well, side effect of that is you become infertile at the age of 14, which means we're sterilising people who are autistic. And I thought there was a, a name, a word, for <laughs> removing people from the gene pool because of perceived difference. And it's not a very nice word, and I can't believe that that's what we're at in the UK. Although, to be fair, the puberty blocker thing is, is pretty hard to access now. They wouldn't meet with them, they wouldn't meet the, the detransitioners, and they wouldn't meet with clinicians that have got concerns about all of this. Um, what we have now is that in Scotland, a 16-year-old can self-diagnose a gender difference on TikTok and change their paperwork so that in law they are of the opposite sex without speaking to a GP, without speaking to a gender specialist and without you know, speaking to their parents which is interesting because some of the political parties, the Greens wanted to reduce that down to um, six-year-olds, which just makes me think, uh, you've never met a child. Like by very definition, children have no insight. Their brains, that's why they are children. That's why we need to protect them and not let them make huge decisions that will impact the rest of their lives when they might change their minds. You need to have options open. What did surprise me was the way that the government tried to silence us, the women, in the public gallery. And, and um, it was really clever, actually. So there was, you know, a lady was removed because she had on a scarf, because accessories are problematic now. Um, we were ignored. We were threatened with arrest. Now, that was interesting because um, when they pass the, the relevant amendments over the last um, few days, and one of the amendments was that um, maybe it's not a great idea if a male person is a convicted rapist, maybe it's not a great idea to put that person into the female prison estate. And um, no, no, the government think that that's fine because it's really important that if that male rapist has a gender difference that we respect their need to be recognised as being female. And you're like, you know, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't lie about it. 
it would be they just they wouldn't they're really trustworthy people these convicted sexual predators oh my word so when they said this there was a, there was a visceral reaction from the public gallery from the women and one in four of us has been raped so it's um no surprise that when your government says we're going to protect the desires of sinister people over your need for privacy, dignity and safety, there was there was an outburst and um, Parliament was suspended and and then we were all to leave, including the women who hadn't said anything, which unusually I was one of. And I said to the, the police lady, um, like, I never said anything, I can stay. And she said, no, you have to leave. And there was a bit of chit chat backwards and forwards. And, and I said, but I'm a citizen trying to engage in a democratic process. I am entitled to sit and watch what my elected representatives are doing. Um, what happens if I refuse to leave? Is that an arrestable offence? And she said, yes. And she phoned for backup because, you know, threat. And um, one of the other women starts shouting down into the gallery, they are threatening to arrest us for sitting quietly. It's just amazing. Um, on the second day, the government said that you had to collect your tickets to get into the public gallery by half past two because there was a rally outside organised by women at one o'clock. So they knew <laughs> that we would be hard pushed to get through the the security system in order to pick up our tickets by half past two. If you went there, they were going to release the tickets um, for a waiting list, which had been created because apparently all the hateful women had, you know, organised themselves and got tickets for something that's important to them. Whereas um, people who didn't organise themselves didn't have any tickets and thought that this was grossly unfair. Well, you know, get your free ticket. It's just filling out the form. Anyway, um, so going through security at uh, Parliament is a little bit like going through airport security and it doesn't take long. They're very efficient, actually, the staff. But come two o'clock, every single piece of clothing had to be um, inspected, everything in a bag, um, everybody was searched. It really, really slowed down. So there was like a backlog of women that are waiting in this quite small room with, you know, the, the snake, you know, the way that they make you queue. And it quickly got jam packed. Now there's one revolving door to get in. So there's a woman coming out of the revolving door and she couldn't move because she had a, a mobility age. She was a woman that had, she, she was older than me. She had a mobility age. She's got mobility issues. As she was leaving the, the, the turning door, the woman in the middle had been a bit stuck. So she shoved the door as a third woman had put her hand into the revolving door to, to take the space. And when the woman in the middle, who was stuck and a bit, you know, it's an enclosed space, pushed it, then the whole thing just moved really quickly and the older lady fell on top of me. Fortunately, I'm quite fat, so it was a soft landing. She didn't break her hip. And the woman in the outside, her arm got jammed in the door and she was really hurt. So then there's this almighty outcry because this is dangerous. They're trying to stall us from getting through so that we can't get our tickets and go observe democratic process. And the net result of that is you've put women at risk. And the people who really helped were the trans activist people, the people that would not agree with us politically, who helped pick up this lady and sort of usher her through, like undid the barrier thing so that she could get to the front because this is just insane. All hell broke loose. It was absolute chaos because they were using the queuing system as a political tool to prevent our voices from being heard or us witnessing what they were going to do to women's rights in Scotland. It, it's, it's just incomprehensible to me. Anyway, it seems that Nicola Sturgeon herself was quite annoyed that there were so many women in the public gallery because she sat with her back to us the whole time. The woman never turned around at all. But at one point she went up the back and she was clearly annoyed that we were there because although most of the time we weren't shouting out, if they said something that was particularly egregious, then there was a sort of a gasp or a groan or or there was a lot of, you know, chit-chat between us. Um, 
And she wasn't happy about it because you could see the MSPs sitting looking up at us because they, they don't usually have a big public gallery. There's not usually that many people are, you know, so interested that they give up their time to go and sit and eyeball people while they take your rights away. And at one point, one of the women was upset and um, I totally understand why she was upset. She was sitting weeping and I, <laughs> I had taken hankies with me, but I didn't have any little neat, you know, like you get a packet of hankies all folded together. I'd just taken like an empty, emptied a box of tissues into a bag. So I handed her what looked like a giant bouquet of tissues. And then other women were kicked off because, you know, it was just awful witnessing this. It was awful. So they all started crying as well. And um, so I'm handing out <laughs> hankies to everybody. Um, and the MSPs couldn't take their eyes off of her because... It's moving. It's very moving when you have somebody visibly upset because of the decisions that you are making. Um, so it was an interesting experience. Now, I am firmly of the belief that women are entitled to single sex spaces and that our rights to safety, dignity and privacy, as in the Equality Act 2010, is... Um, are vital. These are non-negotiable rights because some women really need them and these tend to be the most vulnerable and marginalised women. So women who have, um, who are observant of their Muslim or Jewish faith, women with trauma, women who are in the justice system. Um, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Um, I also think that people with gender differences are, are entitled to being recognised as themselves and their individuality and their own needs. I think that they deserve excellent health care that is free at the point of need and that the waiting lists are dreadful, absolutely dreadful. They are they are awful, counterproductive and doing harm. I think it's four years at the moment to be seen at a gender clinic in Scotland, which is just completely unacceptable. Um, now, there's some concern amongst clinicians that some of the treatments that are given to people with a gender difference are not suitable for all people. They would work if somebody had a gender dysphoria, but if that person actually is struggling with their sexuality or they've got a history of trauma or they've got neurodiversity, then these treatments do not work. They do not address the source of that person's distress. And there's some clinicians that are questioning whether it is ever appropriate to treat somebody's distress, emotional distress, with a surgical knife. And these are medical ethics issues that should be discussed and explored, and they haven't been. What the, What's happened is the Scottish Government have said, well, let's just let 16-year-olds self-diagnose on TikTok. What? Like, they don't see anybody, they just do it on their own. Well, what if that person, that young person who believes, earnestly believes that they have gender dysphoria, what if it's not? How would they know? They need to have an assessment by a clinician who is an expert to make sure we don't make a mistake. Because the consequences of making a mistake to somebody that detransitions are lifelong and, and irreparable. They are devastating to those people. Now, we, we did have some um, people that had detransitioned come and present in Parliament and the committee, most of the committee that was deciding on these things didn't go. They didn't go to hear them. And they were very moving um, submissions because they're incredible sp speakers. And I cannot believe that they didn't go. The MSPs just didn't want to hear vital information on which to make a wise decision. They just didn't bother. So I gave it some thought and thought so this is going to go through. I want to grab attention onto what is important for my community um, because otherwise that's going to get lost and this is our last chance to, to grab some attention. So I thought it had to be really quick and eye-catching and preferably funny. And there's an old, <laughs> there's an old style of protest um, that's global and and ancient that um, women do. It's um, it's a Greek word, so I might mispronounce it, anasirma, um, which is 
women lift up their skirts and do a naked protest. There's accounts of it from, you know, in the Greek myths, um, Baupo did it to cheer up Demeter when her daughter Persephone had been kidnapped by Hades and taken to the underworld. And um, there's accounts from um, wartime in, in Greek times when the men had gone off to fight and they were giving up, they were coming back. Um, without winning and the women lifted their skirts because as a as a defiance to say if you come back and and we lose then those women would be taken into the, the they would be used as sex slaves and they weren't happy about it so they were obviously um there was a, a woman in during the portland riots in the u.s who was known as the or called the naked athena i think they called her and she was you know a young very beautiful woman who stripped and sat down in front of the the policemen who were all in riot gear and just started doing some yoga. And the policemen didn't know what to do because it's so confronting having a naked woman who is vulnerable, um, but also defiant. It's a really defiant gesture for a woman to use her own nakedness as a tool of... It's powerful. Now, it works, I think, because women's bodies are sexualized, you know, by society anyway. So when a woman claims it for herself, it's really, it's really confronting. Whereas if, if a man does it, if a man exposes his genitals, then that is a sexually threatening act because, you know, flashing is a crime. And um, usually because in, in males, then that behavior escalates into something where actually physical harm would be done to women rather than just, just, um, you know, confronting and, and upsetting. There would be physical harm at the end of it. So I thought, well, if my government are going to take away my, my sex-based protections, then I'll act like a man. And, and we're in Scotland. So it's actually culturally allowed for men to expose their genitals in Scotland if they're wearing a kilt. So why can I not just do that? If it's kind of cute and even out with Scotland there was a, a piece of TV recently on Channel 4 where um, a performer who's a trans woman that won um, at the Edinburgh Fringe, Jordan Grey, who is, is a very funny person. I mean some of the songs I'd, I'm not so keen on because it's things, <laughs> they're, they're based around things like um, Jordan is a better woman than I am because you know Jordan's breasts will never sag um, unlike my saggy old tits and I find that a bit like oh, yeah yeah say something original but Jordan's very you know engaging and talented and, and, and is a great performer so it was on the TV and the, fan, the finale is Jordan whips off um, the clothes have got velcro so everything's whipped off and Jordan then plays the piano with Jordan's penis. So if you can do that on the TV, I can get my minge out in Parliament. Why not? Minge is a Scottish word for your pubic hair. However, obviously it would be a crime to actually expose my body in Parliament because it would be, you know, flashing or I don't know what it would be actually. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just fake it because then it's funny. So I got some funky fur and I sewed them onto some opaque flesh coloured tights and I had skin coloured knickers on underneath and I made, <laughs> I made the pubes like what I thought were oversized <laughs> because you're quite a long way away from where the, the politicians are going to be sitting and I knew the press were on the other side of the public gallery and I mean they've got zoom lenses but I thought we'll just make this obviously fake and I can't believe the number of people <laughs> think that was actually my minge that I got out. Um, so it, it did the trick, you know, the, um, <laughs> I got their attention. Um, I wish I'd thought a wee bit more, like I thought quite carefully about how to do it um, so that it wasn't, you know, illegal. Um, I wish I'd thought a bit more about what I was going to say because I said something about if Parliament is going to act without decency to women and girls then I will be indecent and lift up my skirt and it looked like I was flashing and then I think I said get it right up you um, you bass or something and um, that's, <laughs> that's another like really male expression that, that, <laughs> that they would use in Glasgow and I trained in Glasgow a million years ago so, so it occurs to me that I have um, 
left Glasgow, but Glasgow hasn't left me. Anyway, it quickly landed up on the front page of the Daily Mail and social media has gone wild. And it would appear that, um, it depends on what your algorithm is, but some people think that what I did was, was a good thing and some people think that what I did was ridiculous and terrible. Um, and then there's been this sort of factually incorrect reporting, which kind of proves my point with my work that, that you know, people don't know what female genitals are. My pubic hair is not my genitals. And there's one reporter said that he can confirm that those genitals are fake. I'm like, mate, they are not. They are not. I'm not going to show you. The pubic hair is fake, not my genitals. Um, there's been a lot of muddling up vagina and vulva and and pubes in the press and with people online, which goes to show there is a problem with how we perceive women and women's bodies and women's genitalia specifically. Nobody knows what the right words are. So how can you legislate in something that you don't understand? This is silly. They needed expert input, but they didn't listen to me. They listened to a bunch of people with, um, with just opinions. So then, <laughs> then, then my genitals get mis- I don't know what the word would be, misrepresented, I suppose, as being fake, which is, that sounds really transphobic to me, fake genitals. I don't think you should be saying that out loud in a civilised society that's trying to be inclusive. It's absolutely outrageous. Anyway, um, some of the feedback, I haven't, I haven't looked at it, but some people have sent me some clips and um, some of the feedback is that I am too old and too fat for this behaviour. I'm like, well, it's not a surprise to me. Like, thanks for your constructive criticism. Um, random man in the internet doesn't want to have sex with me. Boo hoo hoo. Like, how bizarre. How bizarre. I, I am aware of how old I am. I am aware of how heavy I am. Uh, you know, thanks for your feedback. It's fascinating. Um, Anyway, apparently there's a percentage of people who um, are really concerned that I am, in fact, I was going to say I shouldn't laugh, um, but it is ridiculous that um, that me doing this thing um, is because I'm a paedophile because there were children in the public gallery. Um, of course there were, because this debate had extended and extended and extended, and women have got limited amount of childcare, especially at this time of year, because it's Christmas and all the unpaid labour falls to women. Funny that. And so the kids are off school. So if you've got children and you want to come and to participate in this, you've got to bring them with you. Um, so because there were ch children and noise, then um, I am a paedophile. So apparently then there are people that are so concerned about this, they've been in touch with the police. So that's fine. I'll look forward to having a chat with them about that. Um, I mean, you know, it is Christmas. It, the timing is exquisite and it's been done deliberately. It's so exasperating. You know, the, it it's been done for maximum inconvenience and the extending and extending and extending of the debate has been done for maximum inconvenience. Um, honestly, I'm so exasperated with them. Um, anyway, so I've had lots of help. Thank you very much for those of you who have taken the time to send me stuff. Um, a lot of it has been very funny. I do, I do quite like that, even if I am the butt of the joke. I'm quite comfortable with that, you know, I'm a, a resilient person and um, if it's funny, then that's fine. Um, the the rest of it is just dull, you know. This isn't school. I'm, I'm, I'm a long way past school and um, I've, I really don't need to be popular. It generally doesn't bother me at all. I have plenty of friends, so if some random people on the internet don't want to be my pal, oh, okay then. Um, the thing is that women are very, very good at building networks, informal support, peer-to-peer -peer support networks. And so I know I'm not alone. Um, and and I don't know what will happen. I don't know if I will end up having to defend myself in court. But I am a healthcare professional. That's what you're trained to do. You're trained, it becomes instinctive, to never say anything that you wouldn't be prepared to answer to in court. So I have no fear of that at all. Why would I? What I did, I can justify. People might disagree, 
and that's fine. But I think I can justify it, and I think it was justified. Um, I think that what I say is is not transphobic. I don't think it's transphobic to want people to have effective care that is safe and is free at the point of need and they don't have to wait a long time to access it. I don't think that it's reasonable to just skip the process of having to fix the problem within gender clinics by just saying, well, we'll just let them make it up themselves. If they just decide themselves, then they, they can reduce the waiting list from that. I, this is just <sighs> hashtag not kind. It's ridiculous. So I'm not ashamed. I'm really not ashamed. Um, I know I'm supposed to be, but I'm not. I did what I wanted to do, which was to get some focus onto the thing that's been missing while this dreadful bit of legislation has been put in place in my country. Um, so I'm quite pleased, actually. And if I do land up in court having to defend that, then um, that's fine because it seems to me that they just give you a microphone and people to talk to. And I really like that. So it's fine. Don't mind, genuinely. Um, if it turns out that I am a terrible, hateful bigot, then I'll take whatever medicine is is, <laughs> is awarded to me. Um, anyway, so Santa is coming and that's why everybody's so busy. Um, but I have been a very good girl this year, so I'm expecting a good present. Um, so I hope you have a good festivities. Do you want to see my little mistletoe? It's quite good, isn't it? It's a clitoris mistletoe, um, which you should be get kissed underneath your clitoris, I reckon. It's quite good, isn't it? It goes in my tree. So <laughs> let's everybody have good festivities and then we can regroup afterwards to, to see what we're going to do next. Um, I think the government have got the message that the women are not going to go away. We're not going to give up because whilst many in the trans community think that people like me hate them, um, a lot of us are mothers. Do you know, like, who do you think the mums of these people are? Um, who do you think sees their pain and wants to make it better? We're not going away. We're not giving up on our mothers having privacy, safety and dignity in hospital, like, you know, Irshan in Hospital saying that any woman that didn't want to share a ward with a person who's male is um, akin to being a racist. An unwell, debilitated or immobile woman has to just sit and deal with being scared because she's got trauma because some bloke treated her badly. Because it's about sex, that bit. The, the stuff that's relevant to women and women's rights is about sex. And the fundamental problem here is that you can, human beings cannot change sex. And I think that that should be very clear in legislation that's written down in gender. And the whole way that the submissions were working, the, the politicians kept saying gender when they meant sex. So because of that, because the muddying of the language, we've landed up with this big mess where people that have got a gender difference believe that people like me are hateful. And well, to be fair, that's part, part of the reason that they, they believe that is because the politicians tell them. You know, that there has not been a single trans or non-binary identified person murdered in Scotland since records began. And so in November, when it's Trans Day of Remembrance, I think that we should have a party in Scotland to demonstrate we are an inclusive society. These people are safe. There's one dead woman every three days in my country, murdered by a man, a male person. This is this is a sex-based crime. It's got nothing to do with gender for women. The women's rights bit is just about sex. Stuff about sexuality because gay women would really quite like to socialise and just meet up without having male people there. Why can't we have that? Why can't we have what J.K. Rowling has funded with having a, a, a rape crisis centre for female people with only female people because all the other rape crisis centres can assist somebody that's male with a gender difference that needs their help. I genuinely, genuinely don't understand why women can't have what we need. I don't understand why our voices were not heard in the legislation, but we're not going to shut up. It's, we're not going to...
we're not going to shut up. We'll have a wee rest, everybody, and then um, we'll see what the winch, <laughs> the winch resistance is going to come up with. Um, so to quote J.K. Rowling, have a very merry turf, miss, and um, let's see what happens after the new year. But um, it could be fun. It could be fun. I know I'm supposed to be ashamed. I mean, I'm laughing to myself. I know, I know I'm supposed to be apologetic. I'm just not. Um, so thank you for your help. <laughs>